remember, as the mission is being executed, vision is being realized, belong, believe, and behave. Go to the book of Romans, chapter 1. And I found out from delivering a message this morning that we won't make it all the way through, but we'll get a good safe landing place, and then we're going to just stop there and pick it up on next Sunday as we kind of re-engage the passage of Scripture to allow God to be God in our midst. So Romans chapter 1, um, pointedly we're going to be dealing with verses 14 through 17. Um, but before I go there, let's look to God for a word of prayer. And then we're going to talk through the scripture and allow God to be God in our midst. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for you. I pray for strength, Lord, to say once again what you would have me to say. Open my heart, Lord, to be in tune with you. And as we were sharing, Lord, if there's something Felix should not be saying, silence me, God. We only want to hear from you. We only want to hear a word from you. We only want to know what you would have us to know and be who you would have us to be. So as we engage this passage of Scripture, we thank you for that. We thank you for being God in our midst. My prayer, God, is that if there's one here that don't know you as Lord and Savior, that the result would be, of the result of the message being proclaimed would be them saying or any person saying, I want a renewed relationship with God. I want to be right with God and I want to be called to the service of God. So we bless you, we give you praise, we pray for preaching power, Lord. Replenish me to say what you would have me to say. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Now do me a favor, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I am commissioned and not ashamed. Come on, turn to the other neighbor and say, other neighbor, I am commissioned and not ashamed. Amen. I want us, we're going to be talking about that. We've been dealing with the issue of radical discipleship for several weeks now, I think we have seven weeks to be specific into this thing. And uh, it's just a burning um, place that God has me as it relates to us mobilizing people to be who God would have us to be. So we're going to be hanging out here for a little while. So get comfortable as we hear what God would have us to say as it relates to radical discipleship. Now, does anybody in here realize or understand the truth that your salvation is not solely about you. I just kind of want to open up with that statement so you can process with me. Is that you being saved, it's not solely about you being saved. I've used this statement many, many times throughout the life of the history, uh, the history of this ministry, and I'll say it again, and you're probably tired of hearing me say it. And I say it this way, that God brought you out to send you back in. Come on, does that make sense? Yeah. You, you've been brought out to go back in. We've been brought out to go back in. But the problem with a lot of us is that we fool ourselves into thinking that the reason I am saved or the reason God saved or better stated, when it comes to testimony service or me thanking God, here's what my testimonial service looks like, right? Lord, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for delivering me. I thank you for bringing me out. And then we put a period there, and the rest of the church kind of says, amen, Lord, thank you for bringing them out. Lord, thank you for saving. And we fool ourselves into thinking that's what it's all about. Does that make sense? And so when I come to church, I come to church, or when I encounter anyone else, it's always me, me, me. Look what God did for me. Look at how God blessed. Look at how God saved. And we forget the truth that we're saved for the benefit of others. Let me say it this way. I need you to know this morning that Jesus did not go, leave his home in glory, come all the way to the earth, die on that cruel cross of Calvary just for his benefit. Come on, say amen. The reason he left his home in glory, the reason he came to the earth, the reason he went to Calvary, the reason he died is not because he was sinful, because we knew him to be sinless. Matter of fact, Scripture puts it this way, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So here's the thing that I want you to hear this morning, and I want us to flesh this out. The reason Jesus came and the reason he died on Calvary was for my benefit, and it was for your benefit, and it was for the benefit of the world. Does that make sense? 
So given that principle, given that precept, given that perspective, I think it's important for you and I to understand that the reason we are saved is not solely for our benefit, even though we do reap the rewards of going to heaven to be with God, but I am saved so that God could use me to benefit someone else. Oh, come on, say amen. You got to get this. I want us to understand this, that, that my salvation, my deliverance, your salvation, your deliverance, what God did in you, what God did through you, what God did for you is not solely for you and I to get saved and sit back and wait for the train ride to heaven. God has expectation associated with our liberation. While we are on the earth, he expects us that we work for him to bring someone else into his kingdom. So here's the thing, the testimony that God delivered you from or that God delivered me from, could that very well be the vehicle that he expects that we use to go bring others to a relationship with him? Come on, y'all, I want y'all to say amen with me. We're going to walk through this. We're going to walk through this. God has brought us out so we can go back in. As we look at this passage that's in front of us, if there's any person that had a past, that had a failing, that had a yesteryear, that was not all that God needed him to be, was the man who penned the scripture in front of us, a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul. Paul was one that went around killing Christians. He went around, he just had a terrible past. The way I said it earlier is that if there's anyone with a rap sheet that kind of went a long ways, you're looking at the guy that wrote the book of Romans. And the reason he wrote Romans was that God did something new in his life. God did a phenomenal work in his life. God delivered him, and he felt the need to want to spread this thing that God, or this word that God has given him, or the work that God did in him through the entire Gentile world. So in 57 AD, he pens this letter to the church at Rome, saying to them, I have this desire to come and be with you, and I'm going to say it this way. And his predominant reason for wanting to go there was so he can tell them what God did in him so they can hear about the goodness of God and develop a relationship with him. So look with me, look with me at at Romans chapter um, 1, and let me walk you through this, and we're going to land at verse 14 and begin to talk about the text or exegete the text when we get there. If you're in verse 1, say amen. 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 Let me make sure to come on. Say amen if you're there. Now let me talk you through this, and then we're going to read when we get to verse 14. It picks up by saying, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, and then he has this phrase, call to be an apostle. In other words, here is Paul, who is a slave. That word literally means slave. That's called to the apostolic ministry, meaning that I have this gifting to go about and tell people about what God would have them to do. And he says, set apart for the gospel. And he goes on in the remaining uh, few verses of this chapter to talk about what that gospel is all about. Who about how this gospel is about the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, the descent of David, how he came, he died, and more importantly, he was raised from the dead. So he talks about that now that he's risen from the dead, God graced him with the gift of apostleship. So now he writes to the church at Rome saying, I want to come and share with you. So look with me at verse 8. Say amen if you're at verse 8. He opens up in verse 8 by saying, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow my God, uh, by God's will, I may, may now at last succeed in coming to you. Verse 11 says this, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Here's what he's saying to Rome. Then we're going to read. I want to get to Rome so I can share things with you, the gifting that God has given me. Tell you about gifts so that you may be encouraged and strengthened as a result of this. And he says in verse 12, that is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap um, harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Look at this one more time. I want to get there in order that I may reap 
some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Now look at verse 14. Here's the deal. Here's this, the point that Paul wants to make. I, he says, am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians. Some of your translation says to non-Greeks. I am under obligation to Greek and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. And verse 15 says, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome. Now, there's a couple of things I want to point you through as we kind of talk through the text. Now, here's the first thing Paul says, right? That he has this obligation, he has this debt that he needs to pay. And how that translates to you and I is this. Because of our debt to Christ, we now have an obligation or we are obligated to go into the world and make disciples. Let me say it one more time. Because of our debt to Christ, we are obligated to go into the world and make disciples for Christ. Here's what Paul is saying to the church at Rome, and then we're going to flesh this out. Hey, Roman citizens, I need you to hear me to say this. I have been longing to come to you, and the reason I want to come to you is because I have an obligation or I feel obligated. I have a debt that I need to repay, and the way that looks like is I need to come and tell you about what God has done for me. And let me add this, because if there's anyone that is undeserving of what God did for them, it's me. Oh, y'all not hearing me, yeah. You see, you see, the problem, the problem with a lot of us as believers in Christ is we feel privileged. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on. Some of us have been saved for so long, we fool ourselves into thinking that Jesus left his home and glory, came to earth just for me. Come on, no, 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 no. Don't fool yourself into thinking you're that special. He loves us all. Are you with me? But then we forget what we used to be prior to him coming. Oh, I need a witness or two here. And what happened is we, we now, we've been saved for so long that, that, that we've been walking this walk for so long that we've developed a new mindset, a new mentality, a new all of that, and we forgot what we used to be like yesteryear. Paul says, if you knew me then, <laughs> and what God has done, here's what he says, I am now obligated Here's what this word obligation, it's an interesting Greek word in that it means one who is under, and you never use a word to define a word, but I wanted to do this. One who is under obligation in a moral or a social sense, one who is liable to another for a debt owed, or once again, one who is obliged or obligated to do something. So one who has a binding agreement, either in a social sense or in a literal sense, to someone else for a debt that was owed. Let me give you a couple examples. Maybe not you, because we're all living well in here, and nobody in here has ever sinned, and nobody in here has ever been in trouble. So people from the church around the corner, yeah, um, have gotten in trouble with the law. And y'all heard the term restitution, right? Come on, say amen if you heard the term. And here's what restitution says, that because I wronged someone, I now have an obligation to make it right. So I am a debtor either to the one I wronged for what I did, and now the court has a binding agreement that says I need to repay the debt that's owed. So I am now obligated based on the court system to repay the debt. Does that make sense? See, y'all can't identify with that because nobody in here has ever sinned. Nobody in here has ever owed the court anything. We've never gotten a traffic ticket. Let me tell you something you can identify with. Okay. Every person in here, <laughs> you're homeowners. Some of you are. Come on, y'all. I mean, first service, I drove up and all the Bronco fans were here. Nice cars, nice cars, nice cars. It was just late in the parking lot. So great sermon illustration because I said, uh-huh, all y'all obligated to the bank. Yeah. <laughs> because here's what that looks like, right? You go to the bank and you apply for a loan and the bank gives you a contract and now we have an obligation to repay the debt. Does that make sense? We are obligated. I mean, I remember, I remember when I was a young boy, a little younger, um, I hated, I hated 
repaying debt. I did. Some of y'all are older and you still hate it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so what this looked like, I liked nice things and I liked nice car. And I, my, my, in my mindset, when I got paid, that money was mine. I didn't care who I owed. It belonged to me. So I'd get paid, and I'd just put my money in the bank, and I had a nice little nest egg, and I'm like, yeah, this is what it's all about. But I had this nice car, and one morning, I woke up, and I went outside, and my car was gone. It was, it was, it was. Dumb me called the police. Somebody stole my car. Police says, Mr. Gilbert, you have an obligation. <laughs> that you didn't take care of. So the person you were obligated to took your car. Y'all see how this works, right? If you don't live up to your obligation, y'all seen the truck with the toe on the back that... Yeah, anyway, y'all know nothing about that. Amen. Good law and citizens, yeah. But, but if the obligation is not kept, somebody is held accountable for what's not being done. So here's what Paul is saying is that if you understood who I was and, and how, what, what sort of a sinful, mischievous person that I was. Well, let me, let me forget Paul. Let me talk about me and let me talk about you because all of us have not been that good. But when you think about who we really are, we should have been the one on that cross. Come on. We should have been the one with nails in our hands and nails in our feet. We should have been the one with the sword paste on our side because we were the ones guilty of sin, yet and still, as opposed to allowing the enemy to repossess us. Jesus goes on the cross of Calvary, y'all not hearing me, and he paid the debt for our sin. He died when we should have been the one dying on that cruel cross. So here's what it means. I have a debt now. I have a debt. I have a debt. I have a debt. I owe him my life. Come on, is it just me? Had it not been Jesus, my sentence, my destiny would have been hell. But he paid the price. And Paul is saying the same thing. So here's what Paul is kind of implicating or insinuating in his message. He says, notice, notice he says who the target of his obligation is, right? It's the Jews. It's the, I mean, the, the Greeks and the non-Greeks are bar barbarians. It's the wise and the unwise. So here's what he's saying. I have an obligation now to repay the debt to Christ. And the way I repay my debt is I go to folk who are doing stuff that I used to do. And I'm telling them, you don't have to keep doing that because the same Jesus that saved me is the same God that can save you. Are you hearing me this morning? So I have an obligation to go and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. And the way I repay my debt is whenever somebody gives their life to Christ, ah, or I spread the gospel, Jesus says, payment made. Are y'all not hearing me? And the more I go proclaim the gospel, payment made. You've heard the old hymn that says, will there be any stars in your crown? Some of us have not made a payment in a long time. Come on, y'all. Don't get quiet on me now. You're supposed to say right there, preach anyway, preacher. <laughs> Are you hearing me? That, that, that we're going to be shocked. But the point is, we have an obligation to go out and proclaim the love of God. Here's, he says to the, to the, to the Greek, the non-Greek, to the wise, to the foolish. And he says, my obligation is to go to that target demographic. And my job is to make disciples. Amen. To go tell them about the love of God. So they can develop a relationship with God. So I don't know about you, but, but I'm a debtor. I'm a debtor to Christ. So here's what that means. Here's what it translates to me. I have an obligation to go tell people who are where I was how I got out. Oh, y'all not hear me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I have an obligation to go tell people who are where I was what God did for me and about the saving and delivering ability with God. The problem, though, the reason we don't do it is because we have not properly dealt with the shame of our past. Let me put it to you this way. 
If you're still struggling with you, are you not sure of who you are? You won't tell nobody about what God did for you because you don't even know who you are. Are you with me? So, so here's what Paul says. I have this obligation, but here's what the obligation looked like. And go with me, and here's the result of that. Notice what it says here. Go with me in verse 16. So notice how he picks up by saying this, what? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, and let me add the phrase of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. And look at verse 17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just or the righteous shall live by faith. Here's why I say commissioned and not ashamed. Paul says, the reason I want to get to Rome is because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he talks about the power associated with the gospel. So here, here, I want you all to get this in your spirit, and then we're going to talk this out. Our obligation to preach the gospel is based on the truth, listen to this, that the gospel has addressed the shame of our past. I need, I need two more amens, y'all. I, 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 somebody, somebody, I get it, I get it. Somebody said, no, but, but, but how, preacher? Come on, y'all say it, I get it. But, but how, but, but how, but yeah, some of y'all saying, but, but how, preacher, I still feel shame. Come on, y'all. But how, preacher, I still feel guilt. Come on. But how, preacher, I still feel condemned and you're trying to tell me that the gospel ha, um, has addressed the shame of my past? The boldness that Paul had was the fact that he understood the truth, that the gospel did not define who he was at the present tense, all right? L l let me help y'all. Let me help y'all. Let me help y'all with this. I, I want to talk about this. There there's three things on the screen by way of sub points. Go to number B. Jump to number B, and, and let's talk about B. And don't read nothing else till we get to it, but just look at B. He here's what that word ashamed means literally in, in the original language. To experience or feel shame or disgrace because of some particular event or activity. One more time. To experience or feel shame or disgrace because of some particular event or activity. And the result of that is we become ashamed of and you fill in the blank. Okay? So here, here, here's what this means. It's like, um, say for example you sin. Okay? Let's say, um, um, let me see who here, Everett. Let's say Everett was a pimp. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I said this morning, assuming I was a pimp, and that didn't go over well. Because everybody's like, oh, a preacher. You know, so let me, let me pick on Everett, right? <laughs> assuming, 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 assuming. Uh, I, Lord, I hope that wasn't in your past. Amen. Yeah, Lord. <laughs> But, but assuming, assuming for a moment, right? Here is what that means and what that looks like. Even though God has delivered him, even though God has set him free, the trick and the job of the enemy is to keep him in his yesterday and remind him of the shame of his past. Come on, does that make sense? And the moment we are reminded of the shame of our past, it renders us ineffective and we end up not doing what God has called us to do. Come on, y'all know I'm talking the truth. Come on. If you've ever sinned, if you've ever blown it, if you've ever done anything wrong, regardless of what that thing may be, it could be fornication, adultery, lying. It doesn't matter what it is. Pick the sin, anything. The moment we do that thing, even though we know God has forgiven us, we walk around with the shame and the guilt, and here's what the enemy will do. Whenever you get to a place of deliverance, he has a subtle way of reminding you, see? Come on, I know I'm not just talking to myself. See? Come on, y'all. See? Or, or better stated, you hear of somebody else that failed the same way you failed, and he has a way of transferring their guilt onto you, and it brings shame. And here's what that looks like. We come to church, we go to work, we go out in the community, we go to ministry, and we see someone hurting. 
And because we don't understand the power of the gospel, this is what we do. We are too ashamed to tell them that used to be me. Come on, am I talking to myself this morning? Come on, y'all. Am I talking solely about myself? And, and, and what the enemy does is if he can keep us serving God in shame, he renders us ineffective. He doesn't care about your worship. He doesn't care about your song. Come on now. Because your song is just between you and God. You see what I'm saying? And this is where we fool ourselves into thinking salvation is solely about me and solely about God. And we forget about the horizontal aspect of our salvation. And if he can keep us with just you and God, the whole world is still dying and going to hell in a handbasket. And it doesn't bother him because they're stuck where they are. And nobody is going where they are to tell them, this used to be me. And the same God that brought me out can also bring you out because he keeps us in shame. Are you hearing me? And we come to church guilty. We go to work guilty. We live in shame. And if the enemy can keep shame hovering over you. But I thank, I thank Paul for that little negative adverb, right? Look at C. It says, it's an objective negative. And here's what it does. It denies the reality of the alleged, the alleged, the alleged Oh, excuse me, y'all. <laughs> the alleged fact. You know what that says? All it is that the enemy's putting in your brain is a lie. Yeah. So, so he says, I am not ashamed, meaning that's the Greek word ume, which means that, 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 that the thing that I'm feeling right now is not my current reality. Stop trying to make it my reality. Understand with me, I know this is going to go over your head, but understand with me, you are a spirit residing within the flesh. What you see is not who I really am, because the Bible says if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who has reconciled me. The problem with you and the problem with me is you see the framework that used to do the thing, and you can't see the new man on the opposite. You can't see the new man on the inside, so you judge me based on what you see. Are you hearing me? So you judge me based on what you see because you can't get back the flesh. I thank God that the Bible says man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks where? At the heart. So the allegations are not real. The allegations is not truth. Who I am today is not who I was yesterday. Who I'm going to be tomorrow is not who I am today. Who I'm going to be three months, y'all not hearing me this morning. So the enemy will try to trap you in your past, rendering you ineffective for ministry. And we got to learn to get, we must learn to get past that. Does that make sense? So... This is free. This is free. First service didn't even get this. Here's what it says in, in what's it, James 4? When the enemy comes and says, Sharif, you ain't nothing but a fancy sweater wearing, no good for That's sharp though, bro. Yeah. You, you, you wearing a, yeah, yeah the, I want that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but when he comes, you need to say, get thee behind me, Satan. They kind of say, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Because the Bible says, resist the what? Devil, and he will what? Flee. So when he comes with the allegation, say, I am not ashamed. Because of what God has done. Because of what God has done. So, 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 so look at the thing. Here, here's A. Look at A. The reason I'm not ashamed, he says, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at this real quick. Here's what that Greek word you are galeon mean. The good news of the deliverance we now experience present tense because of the death past tense burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what the gospel does. What Jesus did on Calvary, this is heavy. Even before I accepted him, died, buried, and raised. 
So that Greek word so-so, deliverance of salvation, I have been set free. Oh, my gosh. So when I identify with Christ and the finished work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, he literally releases me and sets me free from who I used to be and makes me a new person in him. Are you hearing me? So when I come to him, here's what this looks like. When I stand before him on judgment day, he's not going to roll a screen down and it's going to have a list of all the sins that I've ever committed. That will not be the situation. The screen is going to come up and the screw in the seam as the screen makes it to the top, it's going to start to drip down with red. And the blood of Jesus is going to continue to cover every sin that I have ever committed. And so here's what it says. When he sees the blood... He passes over me, so I am not ashamed. Got to get that. Got to get that. That's what the gospel does. That's what the gospel does. It sets me free. Lord, we're not going to make this through this. But, but here's the point I want us to get. Don't allow your yesteryear to stop you from going back in and bringing someone else. Here's what I said to the church this morning. We, the church is called Restoration Christian Fellowship, not so much because of you, but because of what God did in this relationship. Amen. So here's what happens. Here's what happens. Here's what happens. A couple comes and they say, Pastor Katani, Pastor Felix, we're going through some difficult time. And, 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 and most people, they don't know our story, so they come in the room. They're all shy. They're all reserved. And, and they look like, please forgive me, Pastor, if I sin. I'm like, I ain't got no heaven or hell to put you in. I swing you and God. I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. And then they'll start telling us their stuff. And Katani and I always look at each other like, wow. And then we'll look at them and say, is that it? <laughs> and they're kind of stopping what do you mean, is that it? And we said to them, been there, done that. Want to see the T-shirt? <laughs> and guess what that does? And you're preaching? No, no, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> God brought me out to put me back in. <laughs> and he forgave me for who I was yesterday. And he anointed me afresh. And he gave me a new calling. And he's doing the same thing for you. It doesn't matter where you were yesterday or what you did or how you're feeling. His blood cleanses us and he wants us to go back in. Y'all, I don't want to offend nobody, but stop being so holy and righteous in your own self. Come on, y'all. I don't want to offend nobody. Are you hearing me? Don't forget where you came from. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop after this statement. Because if you forget where you came from, you won't know how to get back into Pharaoh's palace to release God's people. God put you there to teach you the code, to teach you the language, to teach you to walk, to teach you how to eat, to teach you the mannerism. So when you come out and God tells you to go down on Colfax, don't you be so stupid as to go down, blessed and highly favored of the Lord, the Lord. What's up, dog? How you doing, man? You know the language. You know the code. You know the dress. And the reason a lot of our family members are still stuck in bondage is not because of them. It's because we haven't told them we used to be them. Our kids are doing nothing that they didn't see us do. But because we haven't dealt properly with the shame of our past, we're rendered ineffective as it relates to the proclamation of the gospel. The gospel is lived, not just spoken. Come on, does this make sense? Gosh, we got to pick this up. There's so much more, so much more in there. But, but here's the thing. I want, I want us to leave here this morning knowing that you're commissioned shouldn't be ashamed. Commissioned, and now we have an authority. We are, uh, we said a couple of weeks ago, ambassadors with a mission to go make disciples for Christ. The power of the gospel. Paul says, man, let me come to Rome. People that I used to kill, people that I, I want to tell them what God did so that I could reap a harvest among them. 
It is the power of God. We're going to deal with this next week of salvation. Bow your heads with me. Worship team, come on. Bow your heads with me. Lord, you're wonderful. Lord, you're merciful. Lord, you're kind. Lord, you're all that. I thank you, God, for your word. We have an apostolic calling on our lives <sighs> to go into the hands of the earth and make disciples. Forgive us for failing you. Forgive us for walking in, pr in pride. Forgive us for missing you. So Holy Spirit, Lord, as your word has gone forth, should there be one here that has not said yes to you, draw them to a relationship. Should there be one that have strayed away, bring them back home. Should there be one that have not been effective in proclaiming the gospel, rekindle the fire and the flame so we can be about your business. Forgive me for failing you, God. Forgive us all for failing you. We have these powerful testimonies of your deliverance. But we're sitting on them and all we want to talk about is the miracles of your provision. And we forget that deliverance in and of itself is your providing hand. So we pray, God, that the church would become more active and join you in your work. So move in this place. Move in this place, Lord, and be God in our midst. Move in this place, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing, what you're going to do. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Come on, all stand to our feet this morning.